So as we're talking to this chief and we are laying out everything that we've been doing, all the photographs, the videotape, writing down license plates, all this stuff as a group that we had been doing and giving the information to the police and they're not doing shit with it. Well, in the next day, so that was a Tuesday, on Wednesday morning, front page headline, Ash Street, neighbors, blah, 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 doing all this stuff. And they published it in the newspaper. And, uh, which was good because it got some exposure and it was interesting because we would have a hundred cars a day coming up and down this street, you know, people buying crack. It went to nothing. Once that article went in the newspaper, it went to nothing. And, um, they were, we're like, finally something freaking happened. And, uh, cause these crackheads may not read the paper, but the people that come to buy it are reading the paper like, well, we ain't going to Ash Street, <laughs> you know? So, uh, that really pissed them off. And then, you know, we felt like we were making some headway. And as a neighborhood group, you know, it was a, it was a nice, uh, you know, warm September. We we're like, we should have a barbecue. We should show these motherfuckers that we're not afraid and we're going to, uh, you know, we're going to stand our ground. Well, the city wouldn't let us have a block party because they think like, we can't be liable for the potential violence that might break out. So we're not going to close the street for you. So I was like, well, we'll do it in my house. I had a big side yard at the time. I had plenty of space. You know, I was like, we'll do it here. And it's right, you know, it's diagonally across the street, but still right in front of them. And uh, so we had, I don't know, probably in the beginning, it was like 30 people here, families, kids, you know, from up and down the street, all just hanging out, you know, having a, having a nice barbecue. Well, then those, then those assholes started. And then the first thing was they're just throwing shit, picking up, you know, fruit, rotten fruit off the ground that had fallen off the tree. And they're throwing it at the people in my yard and throwing rocks, bottles, whatever they can pick up and throw. They're throwing it, harassing us. And I'm like. This is bullshit. And, and, and at the time, you know, I, I had some ranger friends, a couple of buddies, you know, younger than me, you know, that, that used to like to come hang out at my house, just get out of barracks. You know, they'd stay here. They wanted to learn, you know, something about some, you know, housing, like carpentry, plumbing, electrical, whatever. They, they were like, I want to learn. I want to I know what you're doing. And uh, so I had a couple of ranger buddies that were already hanging out with me. And so I'm like, we got, we got to talk to these motherfuckers. So the three of us walk across the street. And again, they just think we're army. And, 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 and so we're like, hey, and I knew, I knew the main guy's name was Marco. And I'm like, I want to talk to Marco. And they're like, fuck you, you ain't talking to Marco. And I'm like, why do you want to talk to Marco? And I was like, because you guys better knock off this bullshit and leave these people alone. Quit throwing shit at my house. And they're like, fuck you, motherfucker, blah, 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 give me all this shit. I'm like, you need to knock it up. And so finally the guy, the guy looks at me and he said, you know what, motherfucker? He said, you don't know who you're fucking with. We're going to come back tonight. We're going to shoot you up and burn your house down. And I was like, you know what? Go ahead and make a mistake because you don't know who you're fucking with. Okay, so for the audience, we're going to do something a little bit different today. Um, I'm going to interview a person here that's going to uh, introduce himself in a second. But basically, there are positions within law enforcement that don't have, you know, that aren't police officers, special agents, stuff like this, but they are vital to the job that we do. And for those people that are kind of watching that are interested in law enforcement or maybe just in general positions or what people do within law enforcement, uh, I think you're going to find this a, a very interesting interview. So, uh, with that being said, can you introduce yourself for me, please? Uh, hi, my name is uh, Bill Folk. And uh, Bill, so a little bit, we're going to start a little bit different than I normally do with interviews. Can you tell me, so you were in the Army to begin with before you began your law enforcement career, which I'm going to, uh, yeah. you know, for lack of a better term. You started in 1975 in the Army. Can you give me an idea of what you did in the Army? Sure. Yeah. So, um, it, uh, 1975, you know, the, um, well, actually start 1974. Vietnam is going on. I was motivated. I wanted to join, I actually wanted to quit school, join the Army and go to Vietnam. But I needed my mother to sign. And she refused. She says, if you want to go to Vietnam and kill yourself, you can wait till you're 18. I was in Rhode Island. So I was like, all right, fine. So I had to wait till I was 18. I, as soon as I turned 18, I joined the army under the uh, delayed entry program. And then I had to wait till June to leave. Well, of course, you know, May, 1975, fall of Saigon, Vietnam's over. But uh, I had a really cool recruiter. And I, back then you could enlist to go directly into SF, Special Forces. And that's what my recruiter signed me up for. 
So 1975, leave, go to basic training, AIT, jump school, all that crap, and get assigned to 10 Special Forces Group. And I spent four years there. It was interesting, not not quite what I expected because it was post Vietnam. Uh, there were a lot of you know not not a lot of money. Um, the training wasn't quite what I thought it would be, but you know it was still pretty good. Um, I completed my time there and then um, decided I want to do something different. I re-enlisted and I ended up just by luck got assigned to Sixth Air Cab at Fort Hood um, mm -hmm. in an aviation unit door gunner. And then I spent a couple of years there, but this, so that now this is like early eighties. And, uh, it seemed like every NCO that I knew that I was working around, one or two things was going to happen at a certain point in your career. You're going to get drafted for drill sergeant or drafted for recruiting duty. And I got the letter drafting for me for recruiting duty. So 1982, go to recruiting school and I'm off to Philadelphia. And, uh, I actually, I really enjoyed it. Um, my recruiter was a sharp guy. And, um, you know, he told me, he said, the, the key to success in recruiting is association brings assimilation. He said, you got to make them want to be like you. So every day I'm on recruiting duty. I look sharp. I'm in my uniform. I'm wearing all my crap and uh, sharp. So my recruiter, the guy that recruited me, was actually still on recruiting duty and a very sharp guy. And he gave me some uh, great advice that I will never forget. He told me, association brings assimilation. He said, you got to make them want to be like you. And uh, so he's like, you know, make sure your uniform is sharp every day. Wear all your wear all your crap, have all your awards on, you know, look sharp, be sharp and uh, and make people want to be 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 like you. And so uh, I had a great time on recruiting duty. You know, in Philadelphia is, at the time was you know still a little bit of a patriotic town, um, a Navy town, but that's OK. You know, because there are some people like I'm going in the army. But um, anyway, uh, three and a half years of that good experience, you know, met a lot of great young men and women, you know, good families and uh, sent them down road, down range to be in the army. Um, when my time was up, I was had to go back to big army. and I didn't want to go to big army. I wanted to go back to some type of a special operations unit. And I didn't want to go back to SF unit. So I'd always wanted to go to ranger school. So I decided that. Uh, that's what I wanted to do. So, um, of course, back then, you know, it's like everything is paper, you know, fill out the paperwork, fill out your application. So I got, got the paperwork to fill out. I, um, and I was so determined I wanted to go and I didn't want to get any lost someplace. So I filled it all out. I was in Southampton, Pennsylvania. I took it to Langhorne where my company commander was. I had him sign it. I drove it down to Philadelphia, my battalion commander. I had him sign it. And then from there, I drove it down to DC. I found the guy at the Department of the Army, and I don't even know how I did that, and uh, um, carried it in and stood in front of the guy's desk and handed him my packet. And he's looking at me like, this has never happened. And uh, he looks at my packet. He's like, you really want to go? And I'm like, absolutely, I want to go. And he says, okay, you're going to go. And then that was it. Which I think is a very relevant story for later on when we get into kind of what you did with DEA, because that's the kind of guy you were. You just... Hey, I'm going to do it. And this is the way it's going to happen. You got to make it happen. Got to make it happen. Can't rely on somebody else. Yeah. So anyway, so I waited, got my orders, um, left Philadelphia, went down to Fort Benning. I had to go through, for me as an NCO, I had to go through RIP, pre-ranger and ranger school consecutively. No stops, no failures. Everything had to go. And so fortunately, I mean, it was hard. It was like six months of hell, but, you know, I completed it. Uh, ranger indoctrination program, moved on to pre-ranger, three weeks of that, completed that, went on to ranger school. And uh, that was, it was good, good. Except the first, maybe the first day wasn't so good. Because as an E6 NCO, non-commissioned officer, I just want to blend into the woodwork. I want to be a snuffy, I want to be a nobody. But unfortunately, first day of ranger school, I'm assigned as an admin squad leader for my squad. And so all the squad leaders are in the front row uh, when you're doing PT. So I'm like, not, we're knocking out push-ups or something. So this young E5 ranger instructor gets in front of me and he looks at me and he said, I bet you're an officer, aren't you? And I said, no, sergeant. He said, what are you? I said, I'm a staff sergeant. He said, he said, where'd you come from? And I said, USAREC. And he said, what the fuck is USAREC? And I said, recruiting command. And he said, are you a fucking recruiter? And I said, well, I was sergeant. He said, oh, come here, move fucking recruiter. I got something for you. And he takes me over to the side with these other ranger instructors, and they're just trying to smoke me. 
You know, they're just, I mean, like, I'm, I'm surrounded like five of them, and they're just trying to smoke my back. Get up, get down, do push-ups, do this, roll over, do flutter kicks, blah, blah, blah. you know, and so, um, anyway, I, you know, I was like, I, I know the game. It's just a mind game, you know, so I put up with their shit back in the formation, and, um, and on it went, but, you know, so it was really, that was kind of funny, yeah, so don't ever say, I'm from Userek, you know, make up some other bullshit, you know, I would have been better off saying, well, I was a cook, you know, so no, but anyway, uh, got through ranger school just fine. Uh, my actually my favorite because you kind of grow into it. I mean, you're like you're there 72 days straight through nonstop. By the time I hit Florida phase, which is the last phase, I was like, I, I was just in my groove, man. I had it going on. I loved it. I was in a great squad. I had already had all my uh, goes for patrols. And so, you know, basically, I just needed to complete it. So finish ranger school. Time to go. And then, of course, you know, in the Army, it's, you, it's a dream sheet. It's a dream where you're going to go. A wish list. So my first choice, I wanted to stay. I wanted to go to 1st Ranger Battalion at Savannah, Hunter Army Airfield. I like the South. My second choice was stay at Fort Benning. I could have gone to 3rd Battalion. My third choice was 2nd Ranger Battalion at Fort Lewis. And, of course, the Army sends me to my third choice. And uh, so I get I get up here at my side. I'm a 2nd Squad Leader. For, for third platoon, Alpha Company. I'm an earth pig, or if you know, like, you know, that whole Ranger thing. And um, I loved it. I had a great, had a great squad. Um, I did that for a few months and then uh, moved up to become the weapon squad leader. So I had three great gunners, M60 machine guns, humping the pig, and, uh, you know, AGs. And uh, we did, had multiple, you know, training deployments together, live fire exercises, and it was great. And, uh, but it was kind of funny. You know, the big deal around here is Mount Rainier. I got here in November. I never saw the mountain till March because either, you know, fog, rain, clouds, deployments, whatever. I mean, I'm like, I keep, keep talking about Mount Rainier. I'm like, what mountain? What mountain? And then finally one day the sun is out and I was like, oh, that's what they've been talking about. Yeah. So after a couple of years in Alpha Company, you know, for a lot of NCOs, you know, they've got staff positions they need to fill. And uh, so I got the I got the nod from the sergeant major. Hey, I'm bringing you over to headquarters. I need you to do this job. I'm putting you in training. I want you to do this and, you know, whatever. And I'm like, OK, OK, good. But uh, interesting thing that a actually had had good cons consequences later. And I think the uh, the commander of the sergeant major liked the way I interacted with other people. So they decided to make me the spokesperson for the Ranger Battalion. So anytime visitors would come, whether it be politicians, educators, you know, other military people, whatever, I'm the meter, the greeter, I'm the guy that takes them around, talks about the life of a Ranger and uh, walks them around battalion and answers all their questions and that kind of thing. So it, it was kind of fun, but um, the, uh, that, there was a benefit to that, which will come later, but um, I got to meet a great guy like James Altieri, who had written several books about Darby Rangers, um, you know, from World War II. All right, so uh, I, I get to battalion in November 1986, January 1987. I want to I buy a house. I want to get off post. I want to get out of the barracks. And uh, so I went to a realtor in Lakewood, and uh, I asked him for, you know, a list of houses for sale. And I wanted something pretty inexpensive. Well, the cheapest house on the list was $10,000. So I went there first and that was this house. I pull up and the house is just a shell of a house. It's condemned. There's no windows, no doors, no plumbing, no wiring, but the houses around it are pretty decent. You know, it's an old neighborhood. This house was originally built in like 1910. And so I come, I walk in, I look around, I like the style of the house. I like, you know, the old molding and I can visualize the possibilities here. And uh, so it's like, I'm going to buy it. And uh, so $10,000, I buy the house and uh, start working on it. Of course, I'm working on it between deployments, between training, between all the other crap that's going on. But I'm here working, you know, trying to secure the house, windows and doors. And uh, my neighbor next door, Ruben, had ran an extension cord over to the house because he was so happy to see something happening. He, he let me have power for months. And uh, as soon as and I did all the work myself, I got all the permits myself. I did the plumbing. I did the wiring. I did everything, the building permits. And uh, back then, City of Tacoma was super easy to work with. They, the permit process was easy. The inspectors were awesome. It sucks now. 
but back then it was great. So anyway, as soon as I had a functional bathroom, not even a finished bathroom, I had a toilet, a sink and a shower. Good enough to use. I moved into the house and I started living here. And then uh, I think things were uh, nice and quiet for the first couple of years. In fact, I would have, I'd be working outside or something. And there was this old guy from down the street that was, uh, I think, diabetic double leg amputee kind of thing and he would pull his wheelchair up in front of my house and talk to me while I was working and lots of old people around here they were super super nice but then in the spring of 89 we start doing rehearsal missions for Panama and uh, so we deploy to somewhere you know jump in Eglin somewhere in Georgia whatever we're rehearsal missions for Panama we knew we were going to go we just didn't know when and, uh, and then we come back and every time I came back from a deployment, my neighborhood was just getting worse and worse. There was this house down the street, had at least black gang members down there and it just like hooping it up and cars blocking traffic. And I asked this girl down the street, I was like, Hey, what's up with this house down here? And she said, Oh, those are Crips. That's a crack house. And I'm like, I didn't even know what the hell that was. I didn't even, I didn't know what a Crip was. I didn't know what a crack house was. You know, so my attitude in the beginning was don't fuck with me. I won't fuck with you. And, uh, but that, that changed relatively quickly because they never really did fuck with me. But when they started fucking with the old people around me, trying to chase them out of here, and this is saying, this is our neighborhood now, and you motherfuckers gotta go, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, that shit ain't happening. These people have lived here, you know, most of their lives. So I got with my neighbor next door, Ruben, who was a retired Air Force guy, and I'm like, we gotta do something about this shit. And so he's like, hey, I got, I got a video recorder. We can do this. And I had, I had a view. He did it. So we set up a camera in my upstairs window, watching this crack house, recording all these t t transactions and uh, calling the police. And it was insane because we could have pictures of video of these guys doing this hand to hand. You could clearly see the little baggie and, you know, going in and the cash coming out. And the police are like, well, we can't do anything about that. I'm like, you know, they, the, 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 uh, the um, attorneys won't prosecute it. I'm like, well, he's like, we can't prove it's crack. I'm like, you gotta be shitting me. They're not selling fucking Avon, man. Come on, give me a break. It was so stupid. It was absolute bullshit. And uh, anyway, you know, we, we would, uh, the one time during the summer, I can remember sitting out here, July, talking to Ruben on my front porch. And there had been earlier in the day, there had been a gang related shooting, Crips and Bloods. So Bloods are in another part of town. The Crips are over here. And they had this, of course, this like bang, 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 you know, shooting at each other, just rounds going off wherever. And uh, usually the police would never respond. You call 911. You know, is the shooter still there? No. You know, did you shoot the shooter? Yeah. And, uh, you know, just stupid questions that are like, well, if we have somebody available, we'll send them. Of course, the police department is severely understaffed, you know, and their hands are tied. Um, so this July day, police finally showed up, two patrol cars. I, I watched the guys get out of the car, walk across the street, and they're talking to these gang members. And oh, I can hear them. These gang members are like, fuck you motherfuckers. Why don't you fuckers get out of here? And blah, 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 blah. Don't you fucking come around. We're going to do what we fucking want to do. Blah, blah, blah. You know, I'm like, oh shit. I grew up in Rhode Island. You don't look cross-eyed at a cop. If you do, you're getting knocked upside the head, put in cuffs and hauled downtown. So I'm thinking to myself, oh, well, man, these guys are going to go. They're going to haul their asses out of here. Nothing. The guys walk back to their car uh, and they just left. left. I, I'm like, what is that? And I, uh, so I walked up, to, I went to the cop and I was like, what is that bullshit? And he said, there's nothing we can do. I'm like, fuck that. And I said, what about that? You know, I, I said, the way they talk, he said, freedom of speech. I'm like, fuck that. That's not a freedom I sport to defend. You know, that's bullshit. And, uh, and the guy explained to me how, there was nothing that they could do based, based on department policy, you know, city politics and the bullshit that was going on here. Their hands were tied. It was pretty fucked. And so that as, as, an, as a neighbor, somebody thinks, you know, hey, the police job is, you know, support and defend. There's no defense here. So uh, it was it was shocking. I just couldn't believe this is the kind of crap that was going on. And I ended up hearing the same story from a lot of other policemen. Well, things kept getting worse. I'm still deploying, come back, deploy, come back. And uh, by, sep by uh, early, well, all, late August, early September, things were really shitty. And uh, they would have four cars parked across the street, completely blocking the traffic and not, like not letting people through. So people couldn't get to their houses. I mean, they're just loud, you know, try to intimidating, you know, people. And uh, it, it was pretty fucked up. So in early September, they were having a community meeting at the People's Center. And... Uh, 
Fortunately for me, I was in town, got my neighborhood group together, and we all went to this meeting. And uh, Ray Fietlin, who was the chief of police at the time, was doing this presentation to all these neighborhoods, talking about the problem. It, it, he's just a politician. He's just like, you know, total BS. Everything he said is just trying to, you know, like, oh, it's not that bad, and we're doing this, and we're doing that. I was like, you're full of shit. And uh, so when it finally came to the question and answer time, I had the opportunity, and I knew the answers already because I had already been down and talked to the crack abatement team. I had taken pictures that I had photographed right here, these guys doing drugs. I had taken pictures. One picture, I had nine gang members in this picture. And the guy looks at me and he said, yeah, yeah, I know these guys. And five of the nine had warrants. I'm like, well, go get them. They're right there. They're not hard to find. Go arrest them. He's like, we can't because there's no room in the jail. I said, so I got these fuckers on my street because you can't lock them up and put them in jail. And I was like, this, this is just insane. So anyway, but he gave me all the information. So I go, I asked the chief. I was like, you know, I'm trying to pin him down. How many crack houses are there? Oh, you know, there's this. I was like, I was like, there's 1,300. So I gave him the answer. And he's like, oh, well, well, well there is over 1,000. He wouldn't admit it, but there's 1,300. 1,300 crack houses in the city of Tacoma in, you know, 89. And, uh, and they talked about, you know, they had eight man crack abatement team, you know, trying to shut down 1300 houses. And he starts pouting this shit off about, well, you know, we shut this down and shut this down. I was like, did you shut them down or did they move? And he's like, well, yeah, that's a problem. They usually just relocate. So they're not, they're not doing shit. But, uh, so I made him uncomfortable enough that, uh, he decided that he wanted to cut my group from the herd. He's like, you guys, you guys got to go, go, go. So he's making sure he's like, Hey, I want you to go meet with my assistant chief in that room over there and get us out of there. And so uh, we pick up our shit. We go, we move into this other room with one of his assistant chiefs. Well, I didn't know, but somebody that came in there with us was a reporter from the News Tribune. So as we're talking to this chief and we are laying out everything that we've been doing, all the photographs, the videotape, writing down license plates, all this stuff as a group that we have been doing and giving the information to the police and they're not doing shit with it. Well, in the next day, so that was a Tuesday, on Wednesday morning, front page headline, Ash Street, neighbors, blah, blah, doing all this stuff. And they published it in the newspaper, and uh, which was good because it got some exposure. And it was interesting because we would have 100 cars a day coming up and down this street, you know, people buying crack. It went to nothing. Once that article went in the newspaper, it went to nothing. And um, they were, we were like, finally, something freaking happened. And because uh, these crackheads may not read the paper, but the people that come to buy it are reading the paper like, well, we ain't going to Ash Street, <laughs> you know. So uh, that really pissed them off. And then, you know, we felt like we were making some headway. And as a neighborhood group, you know, it was a, it was a nice, uh, you know, warm September. We we're like, we should have a barbecue. We should show these motherfuckers that we're not afraid and we're going to, uh, you know, we're going to stand our ground. Well, the city wouldn't let us have a block party because they think like we can't be liable for the potential violence that might break out. So we're not going to close the street for you. So I was like, well, we'll do it in my house. I had a big side yard at the time. I had plenty of space. You know, I was like, we'll do it here. And it's right, you know, it's diagonally across the street, but still right in front of them. And uh, so we had, I don't know, probably in the beginning, it was like 30 people here, families, kids, you know, from up and down the street, all just hanging out, you know, having a, having a nice barbecue. Well, then those assholes started. And then the first thing was they're just throwing shit, picking up, you know, fruit, rotten fruit off the ground that had fallen off the tree and they're throwing it at the people in my yard and throwing rocks, bottles, whatever they can pick up and throw. They're throwing it, harassing us. And I'm like, this is bullshit. And at the, and at the time, you know, I I had some ranger friends, a couple of buddies, you know, younger than me, you know, that, that used to like to come hang out at my house, just get out of barracks. You know, they'd stay here. They wanted to learn, you know, something about some, you know, housing, like, carpentry, plumbing, electrical, whatever. They're, they're like, I want to learn. I want to I know what you're doing. And uh, so I had a couple of range buddies that were already hanging out with me. And so I'm like, we got we to talk to these motherfuckers. So the three of us walk across the street. And uh, again, they just think we're army. And, 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 and so we're like, hey, and I knew, I knew the main guy's name was Marco. And I'm like, I want to talk to Marco. And they're like, fuck you, you ain't talking to Marco. And I'm like, why do you want to talk to Marco? And I was like, because you guys better knock off this bullshit and leave these people alone. Quit throwing shit at my house. And they're like, fuck you, motherfucker. Blah, 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 blah. Give me all this shit. I'm like, you need to knock it off. And so finally the guy, the guy looks at me. And he said, you know what, motherfucker? He said, you don't know who you're fucking with. We're going to come back tonight. We're going to shoot you up and burn your house down. And I was like, you know what? Go ahead and make a mistake. Because you don't know who you're fucking with. 
and and then we walked away. And I, and then most of the time, and encounter these you know guys during during the year, it's when they met up with some resistance, they would usually back down, which is kind of what I expected. And uh, but for some reason, you know they 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 felt emboldened that day, and uh, they weren't backing down. So we kind of watched. Oh, and the interesting thing again, back to my job as the spokesperson for the battalion. I had a business card from a reporter from the News Tribune because of the impact that that article made. So I called this guy up, had his business card because I met him at battalion. I called him up, Dan Bopel. And I'm like, hey, Dan, this is Bill Folk, um, you know, Army Ranger, blah, blah, blah. We met him. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember you. And I said, hey, I said, uh, you know, I said, you might not know this. I said, but did you, you saw the story about Ash Street? And he said, oh, yeah. I said, well, I live there. And uh, I said, we're having a neighborhood barbecue. And I said, if you're available... I'd like you to come to this barbecue. I'd like you to talk to my neighbors. I'd like you to see firsthand the kind of shit that's going on here. And uh, maybe you could write something about it. He's like, oh, yeah. I'm like, yeah. So he said, he says, hey, is it okay if I bring a photographer? I'm like, absolutely. So he brought this guy, Russ Carmack. So Dan and Russ come to the house. And uh, Russ is like, holy shit. So he goes upstairs to the window that has a, you know, the view of the thing. He's got a 600 millimeter lens on his camera and he's taking pictures, taking pictures of these hand to hand. Cause there's still with some people that are coming, taking pictures of the hand to hand, taking pictures of the drug dealers. But then he started taking pictures of all the gang members that were moving in and all the guns. There were two cars parked in front of the house over there and a car would drive by and they would open up the trunks and they would transfer guns and guns, rifles, handguns, shotguns. They would just start loading this trunk with all these freaking guns. And, and they'd they holler downstairs, Bill, we have a problem. He said, uh, there's a lot of people over there and they got a lot of guns. And then I'd go upstairs and he'd show me some pictures, you know, I'm like, holy shit. And uh, so uh, anyway, they, um, I, I, you know, I was like, eh, you know, still, it's hard to say what's going to happen, right? Well, then the harassment thing started again, you know, then they're like, you know, they're driving by and they're like, you know, pointing the gun finger and this bang, bang, and just doing some shit. Well, to be prepared, I, I had a lot of building materials and I had collected some planks that had come off of a dock at Fort Lewis out on the water. So this wood was 12 inches by three inches by 16 feet long. And I had like six of these boards. I mean, it's, it's like wicked heavy. And I took a couple of sawhorses. So I put the sawhorses in the front yard. And then I took this lumber and I stacked it three high, two deep. So now we got a barricade that's like 16 feet long, three feet high, and six inches thick. So if, if anybody starts shooting, anybody that might be in the, in the yard could get down behind this thing and have protection. Now we did, we did a few other things. You know, there's a stairwell on the side over here. Did a couple other things, you know, to basically pr pr preparedness. But that was, to me, was like our main, you know, defensive position was like, get behind that barricade and, and you're fine. Well, then uh, things started escalating a little more. A lot of, a lot of just, you know, this, blah, 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 fuck you guys and, and shit coming by. And, and then the, uh, the thing that was kind of like the warning shot was actually a real shot. A cart driving slowly down the street. Guy in the passenger seat, seat, and then just boom, fires off one round in front of that, just straight up in the air, just fires off one round in front of the house, and they just kept on driving slowly. And I, I'm looking, I'm thinking to myself, fuck, man, these guys, they, they might be stupid enough to actually carry out their threat. And so, uh, again, you know, being prepared as a ranger, rangers live by a ranger creed, which part of that says, never to leave a fallen comrade to fall into the hands of the enemy. And I'm well known in battalion. I call the staff duty NCO and the charge of quarters in all four companies. And I'm like, is this certain folk? I'm about to come under attack at my house and I need every, avail every available ranger now. And uh, gave him the information, the address, and I said, please just go round up whoever you can, send it to my house. Well, being a Saturday evening, you know, a lot of rangers are out doing what rangers do, you know, and so, uh, but they managed to round up 15 guys, 15 rangers, all personal weapons, all off duty, sent them out here. And uh, so the rangers show up, and I'm like, good. And of course, and then in the meantime, prior to that happening, you know, there were kids here. And I was like, kids can't stay. We got to get, you know, this is not safe. Got to get, got to get the kids someplace else. And in fact, I even gave the adults the opportunity. I says, hey, if you think this is too risky, I was like, if you want to, if you want to, if you want to call it, we'll call it. But if you want to stay, you know, if we want to stand our ground, then that's what we're going to do. And everyone was like, no, no, we're going to stay here. And so I'm like, okay. So when the Rangers showed up, and of course, a lot of the civilians are armed. They got their own guns. And, uh, but my plan was to be, I wanted to pair the Rangers with the civilians. 
because I figured that was our best chance of, you know, of success if we did get attacked. And, uh, and I told the Rangers, I said, look, while you're, while you're paired up in these positions, talk to these guys about, you know, target acquisition or a trigger squeeze or any, you know, anything you want, try to mentor them, you know, so that they're a better, you know, companion partner in, in your position. And, uh, and the Rangers were like, they were, they were like totally into it. They were like, absolutely. So, and it was really funny. There was this one, um, most of the women stayed in the house, but there was one neighbor down the street, this black gal, Shirley Luckett, a little short black lady, man, she was a pistol funny. And, uh, so finally came around and, uh, you know, I, I guess people just assumed that she was going to go in the house and she's like, I'm not going in the house. I'm staying out here with these Rangers. I got my own gun and that, that, So, you know, she just, she was like, just hung out and, and, and just great woman. And, uh, so she hung out, she got into position and she was working with a Ranger and, you know, that, that was kind of how it went. Well, things stayed pretty quiet. You know, everybody's in positions. I mean, these guys, these guys were prepared. They actually built a sandbag fighting position up in the back corner on the alleyway. Yeah. Cause we had a little time. These guys were like, hey, we're bringing sandbags. And, uh, <laughs> I thought that's pretty cool. And, uh, so anyway, things were relatively quiet until about nine 30 and then things got like really quiet. And, uh, I, I can remember I'm walking around in the front yard out there and then all of a sudden, man, it's like, it's like being on a military firing range where somebody says, commence fire. And it's just pow, 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 pow from every direction. And, uh, just, you know, just dozens and dozens of rounds going off. And it's kind of funny, you know, these are craftsman style houses. Well, my house and my next door neighbor's house, Ruben, basically same style built at the same time. You know, my house was a light tan color. His house was a light purple color. But in the dark, they looked the same. And so, I mean, I could hear bullets smashing the house, hitting it, you know, like glass breaking, whatever. But I can hear the same thing over there. So Ruben's house got shot to shit as well as this one. And they were shooting from basically all sides. And they, but they're using, you know, they're not, they're not, they're just shooting. You know, they're just like pointing a shooter. They're hiding behind the houses or cars or bushes or trees, whatever. So then the Rangers, I told them, I was like, look, you know, don't shoot unless you have a target. You know what? And if you do have a target, if you see a muzzle flash, shoot in the direction of the muzzle flash. Don't let them advance on us. And uh, so that's kind of how it went. So, you know, in the, in the news report, 300 rounds fired, not 300 rounds fired by the Rangers, 300 rounds fired at the Rangers by the gang members. And there were rangers that returned fire when they had the opportunity. And, and despite, you know, what the report says, there were three bang gang, three gang bangers that got shot. One got shot right out here. First guy got shot right out front. He was, he came from behind this old Granada that was parked out there and he starts to run across the street. And my buddy laying in the prone out there, Bill Alexander, who I verified the story with, <laughs> he was laying in the prone 45 and shot the guy. And they hit him in the shoulder and he went down. And um, so, uh, you know, it, it, it's kind of funny. And then two other guys got shot in the, in, in the back, in the alleyway back here. But uh, so when the police came, you know, when the, the first, first car on the scene flying down the street and uh, lights and sirens going, windows down because it's hot. And, and we're like, immediately we stop. We're like, lay your weapons down, whatever. We immediately stopped shooting. But the gang members did. And so this guy is like, it, had, it was like a scene from Die Hard. He's like, bam, 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 bam. And all of a sudden, this guy's like, Err! screeches to a halt, bangs that thing in reverse. And he's like, Meow, burning rubber back down the street, spins it around in the intersection and gone. And I stood out there and look, I'm like, oh shit, there goes the police. Now what do you, pick up your guns. So, um, so then we wait. And uh, shooting is still going on. And uh, I decided to, to move from the front to the back to see what was going on back there. And then, and then, I, I, things all of a sudden got quiet and I was like, what the fuck? And then, so I, I step up into the alleyway and the next thing I feel is some guy on my back and I'm like, boom, down to the ground. And then the shooting started again. And then, so and I knew it was a cop and, uh, that he was the one that he, you know, basically took me down to the ground and, uh, and the shooting started and I was like, Hey, Hey, you better tell your guys to watch out, stay down. I said, these guys are shooting at us. And, and he's like, and he, he was a guy that was new the area. And he's like, and, and so I try to explain, he's like, what the fuck's going on? So then I tell him and he's like, well, who the fuck's in charge around here? And I said, well, I guess that'd be me. 
So, so and this is happening, a very, very quick conversation. So he gets on the radio, you know, tells his officers what's going on because he knows, you know, and um, we ended up getting the, the Rangers all kind of like migrated back into the yard and the police officers started moving and chasing. All the gangbangers decided to run down the street and they were running toward a park down there. Well, the thing about the park is it's like one way in, one way out. You know, you can't get out the other side because there's a cliff. And uh, so the police end up chasing all these gangbangers down there. They've got them rounded up in this park, and there's probably like 25 of them or whatever. And um, and then, uh, you know, there's a guy There's a guy here that's like, you know, it's like, all right, let's talk. What's going on? And so he talks to some of the neighbors. He talks to me. And, and so myself and, and one of the other rangers are walking around with him and kind of telling, trying to explain what's going on, how it's happened to where we were, where they were. And, uh, and I told him, I was like, there's a guy that got shot right there. And then a person got shot over there and a guy shot in the alleyway right here. And he never left the yard. He looks out there and he said, yeah, well, I don't see him now. So we're just going to call that a zero. And I'm like, okay. You know, so maybe I think in a way he was doing us a favor, but in a way he was not because, you know, that didn't report well when the Rangers got into a, you know, a 10 minute gun battle and didn't shoot anybody, but they actually did. So, uh, but that's how the official port went and, it, you know, that's just whatever. So, um, anyway, we walk around with them and kind of explain it. Things are settled down. They've got all the uh, gang members down the street. And, uh, and of course, these are, all, these are all people that we know who they are. But then the police come down and they're like, hey, we need you guys to go down there and identify them. And unfortunately, you know, Rangers have integrity. And we're like, I never saw any faces. It's one guy saw one face and that was it. And so go down there and he said, and they, you know, I'm like, we could have, we could have gone down there and said, yeah, every single one of them, but we'd be lying. And, uh, you know, we can't, you're not going to say what we didn't see. Couldn't actually see more than likely it was them. You know, what the police should have been doing is dusting them for powder. You know, they should have been doing something else other than relying us to uh, identify shooters, you know, that happened in, in pitch black dark. So, you know, they end up arresting one guy, cut the rest of them loose. And then, um, they, uh, it was interesting because then they, uh, you know, they, they, the, 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 the Crips must have a phone tree that they activate when this kind of shit happens because within no time, they were freaking another hundred gangbangers over at that house, just like massed up there in the yard all over the place. And, uh, the police were like, fuck, you know, this is bad. And uh, I found out from one of the officers, they actually had SWAT down the street and around the corner where it was not visible. They were on standby in case, you know, things went to shit in a hurry that SWAT was already here. But, um, so things kind of, things kind of did diffuse a little bit. And then, um, another thing that the police did that I thought was really good was, you know, they, um, we had plenty of guns. And when the police came, I, I which was already kind of pre-planned is like, ditch your guns, you know, and uh, because I knew that they'd be confiscating them. And we didn't ditch them all, but we ditched a bunch of them. And so the police went around and they're like, grabbed whatever guns they could see, but they didn't look. They weren't searching for additional guns. And, uh, but the one, the officer says, all right, you know, we're, we're taking your guns and we're leaving. And I'm like, what? what? I said, you see what's going on across the street? And he's like, yeah. And, uh, and I said, and I said, well, what are we supposed to do? And he said, well, if I were you, he said, I'd call some more of your friends and I'd get some more guns. And I'm like, oh shit. And so um, the other thing that happened was, you know, when the kind of when the dust settled, I was working for a uh, battalion XO, a guy named Clyde Newman. He was a major and awesome guy, really, really good guy. And, and we would have these great conversations and he didn't know what was going on in the neighborhood, but he knew I was working on this house and all that kind of stuff. And he would like to talk to me about real estate and whatever. And, um, but he was the kind of guys like, Bill, if you ever have a problem, I want to be the first to know. And I'm like, okay, yes, sir, I, I, you will. And uh, so when that, when the, when the whole incident happened, I thought this might be one of those times when I probably should let him know. So I called back staff duty and I'm like, Hey, I need to, I need to get a hold of Major Newman. I need to give him a message. And so they, they page him and, and he calls me back. And I said, sir, I said, Hey, listen, this is what happened. Everybody's fine, but I just want you to know. And I explained to him what happened. He's like, I'll be right there. And so I'm thinking he's just going to come over. Right. Well, I didn't realize he was going to bring the battalion commander with him. And uh, so the two of them show up and the battalion commander, he's all like pissed off because come to find out they were at the officer's club, you know, drinking and doing whatever they're doing, you know, so we fucked up their night. 
And, uh, you know, the battalion commander just could have stayed there. We didn't need him here. But anyway, he shows up all pissed off, barely talks to the police, barely talks to the neighbors. You know, he just gets the rangers, sits him down in this living room. And uh, he's like, what the fuck, rangers? He said, I want you to get your shit. And you go back to the barracks and you stay there and don't leave. And, and that was it. And then and the police were trying to talk to him, but he just like. Bah, bah. And, uh, and then he looks at me and he said, Sergeant Folk, he said, I can't order you to leave your house but I strongly suggest you do. And I said, sir, I said, have you seen what's going on across the street over there? I said, you see how many gangbangers are over there? He said, yeah, so what? I said, if I leave here, they will come back tonight and they will burn this thing to the ground. And he's like, well, you got fire insurance, don't you? And I just like blew up. I'm like, what the, f what? What the fuck, man? Whatever happened to defense of the nation begins at home. You know, whatever happened to, you know, defend my property. I was like, I just couldn't believe it that this, this, this fucking battalion commander could utter those words out of his mouth. And I just started going off, man. And then Major Newman, he like grabbed me by the arm and dragged me in the bathroom. He's like, sorry, shut the fuck up. Shut up, shut up, shut up. And, and, he, and he gets me in the bathroom, and, you know, and he's like, close the door. He's like, look, you're right, but shut the fuck up. You know, so, so he, he calms me down and then, uh, you know, the two, the, the Rangers had to leave. The two of them left, you know, and then it's getting to be like two o'clock in the morning. The last remaining police leave and there's still a shitload of, you know, gang bangers over there, but nothing, fortunately nothing was going on. And then, uh, you know, my, but my neighbors are all still here and we still have guns. And, uh, so I asked the neighbors, what do you want, what do you want, what are you guys going to do? And they're like, fuck that. We're staying here. You know, <laughs> I say, if anything's going to happen, it's going to happen here. And so they were like 15 people that spent the night in the house, just crashing wherever they could. All had their guns with them, you know, just all fully dressed, ready to go, but just in case. So then, um, and then the funny thing was Dan Mappel was also one of the, he was the writer. He was one of the last guys to leave. And so when he's leaving, he says, hey, Bill, don't be surprised when you start getting calls from the TV stations tomorrow. And I'm like, why? You know, we've had freaking, we've had shooting on this street all summer long. Nobody ever called. And uh, he said, oh, they're going to call. So sure shit, seven o'clock in the morning, the phone starts ringing. Cause back then it was all landlines. I got a listed number. I'm in the phone book back when we had phone books, you know? And, uh, so sure as shit, it was like, you know, King five, Cairo seven. And I think Q13, they're calling up and they're like, Hey, we, we, we heard about your story. We want to send a crew out to interview you and your neighbors. And I'm like, okay, fine. Because I'm thinking to myself, the more exposure, the better, you know, that seems to be the only thing that gets, you know, these people's attention. And uh, so sure shit, about nine o'clock, there's three news crews out there and they're kind of spaced out, you know, on the street. And, uh, you know, my, and I didn't, I didn't want to be the front guy. I wanted my neighbors to be out there. I wanted them to talk to the neighbors. And so um, I'm kind of like hanging back and, uh, you know, they're talking to Shirley Luckett and they're talking to um, John, who still lives down the street and um, about, you know, the, the shit that was going on. And these are two black people, Shirley and John are, you know, are black people. And so the people that tried to make it sound like it was a racial thing is all bullshit. That's not what it was. It was all right and wrong. You know, it was about these gang members that trying to, you know, trying to like destroy this, you know, perfectly good neighborhood. But anyway, they, um, so then it was kind of funny. Joyce Taylor, who's still on the news here, she was a reporter at the time. So she's standing in the street over there with a crew and she's got one of those Motorola brick phones. And I'm watching because I'm standing back in the yard while, while these other people are being interviewed and the door of the crack house opens up and then all of a sudden these gang members start, you know, piling out of the house. like, blah, blah, blah. And I see her look and she's got this look on her face like, oh shit. And I could see, you could clearly see what she was doing. Bang, bang, bang. 911 gets on the phone. So she called 911 immediately as soon as they started coming out of the house and then made the call hung up, whatever. And then they freaking migrate their way down here. And then they try to like, these motherfuckers started it. They shot at us with Uzis and AK-47, the blah, 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 all this bullshit, you know? And then a fight breaks out between Shirley and Renee, these two women. They, this fight starts bright and women are brutal. Man, they're like going at it, you know? And all then all of a sudden the guys jump in and now we got this freaking brawl going on in the street out front. And, um, you know, unfortunately, it didn't last that, that long because once, once the, it was weird. Once the fight with Shirley and Renee what got broken up, then it all kind of broke up. But, uh, but still, there was a fist of cuffs fight out here. This is the morning after, and uh, it took 27 minutes for the police to arrive when Joyce Taylor made the call. And that, so that didn't go well. That was not a good thing. So you know, the night before, you got a friggin' gun battle going on, and it takes the police 27 minutes to show up the next morning. You know, when there's a fight erupts. So 
after the fight, all the gang members went back to the house and, you know, they kind of calmed down. Fortunately, I think very fortunately, nobody, nobody brought a gun that morning, you know, because if, 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 if that had happened, that'd have been, that would have been really ugly. But, you know, they didn't bring any guns. We didn't have guns. So it was just a fight. But, um, you know, it was, uh, it, 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 it was surprising to me. The whole story made like national news, mm -hmm. I, which I never expected. And, um, you know, they, uh, um, but what was really, I didn't expect was the army's response. I'm the thinking, my, I'm a young army ranger. I'm doing the right thing. I'm defending my home. I'm defending my neighbors. I'm doing what I was trained to do. I took an oath for, you know, years of my life, an oath to support and defend the constitution. And, um, and then, but big army, man, even the, even the ranger community was like, like, this is fucked up. We can't have this ranger doing this. And, uh, but they never bothered to ask why. Nobody ever asked, like, how did it get to this? How does that start? This wasn't just some, like, random, you know, like, hey, we're going to get into a shootout tonight. I mean, there was a lot of things that led up to this. They never bothered to ask the fucking questions. And um, so a couple of things happened that I thought were, were, were pretty fucked up and discouraging. Um, this guy named General Waller had assumed command of I-Corps. And uh, this is like a couple of days after, you know, the shootout. So I get word, it's like, hey, you need to go report to the CG. I'm like, what the fuck's this guy want to see me for? He's a fucking three-star general. I'm a staff sergeant. You know, so anyway, I, I get the word, I got to report. So I, in my first stop, I got to go to the public affairs office. And um, and so I walk in the lobby and there's like nobody there. I'm like, what the fuck is everybody? But they got the TV on in the lobby. And at the moment, it was kind of funny. They, the, the General Waller was being interviewed by someone on the TV and they're showing the interview. So I'm looking at the TV and just for whatever reason, I look at the TV and I said out loud, oh, so that's what he looks like. And then all of a sudden there was a voice behind me that said, yeah, he said the same thing about you. And I'm like, oh, I'm not, I'm not alone. And uh, turned out, I think this guy's name was Rosenblatt. He was a super awesome guy. He was a Vietnam vet and he was in the uh, guard, like working on, uh, like in an aviation unit. But he worked there at the, at the public affairs office, you know, as his um, DOD job. And uh, the only guy, freaking the only guy on base that had my back. He was the only guy that would call me up and warn me when heat rounds were coming or when they were trying to ambush me or some other kind of shit. So I'm very, very thankful to that guy. But um, anyway, I got to go report to the CG. And, 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 and walking in, it's exactly what I would expect. You know, some mahogany row and you got this great big conference room and this huge table. And the general is sitting at one end of the table and there's an empty seat at the other end. Now, one side of the table is the whole I-Corps staff. You know, I mean, there'd be like eight people sitting on the other on one side. On the other side of the table was the whole command staff from the range battalion. Battalion commander, the XO, the sergeant major, my company commander, the first sergeant, all sitting on the other side. And I walk in, I report, and I like, sit down. And uh, so I sit, and I'm expecting, I'm thinking that we're going to talk. They're going to ask me questions. And then all that starts happening is there's a conversation between the general and the two staffs. Like, how can we fuck this guy? What can we do to him? You know, how can we get him out of the army? How can we get him out? And, and, and fortunately, the JAG is sitting in there. And every time they came up with some fucked up scheme, the JAG's like, you can't do that. You can't do that. You can't do that. You can't do that. You can't. And they're like, the, the JAG is like, you know, there's nothing you can do. And uh, which really pissed them off. And so um, finally, they just, the general says, all right, you know, and then I think with the advice of the JAG, they're like, well, just leave it a civilian matter. It happened, you know, it was a civilian matter. It happened off base. It was off duty. Leave it as a civilian matter. Don't, don't get, don't get the army involved. And so the general like, all right, sorry, folks, that's what we're going to do. They're going to leave it as a civilian matter. Do keep the army out of this. Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, that's why I never intended to bring the army into it, you know? And so uh, I get dismissed and I leave and I'm starting to walk down the hallway. And then like, just within a couple of seconds, all of a sudden there's this voice behind me, sorry, folk. And I stop and I turn around like, it's a colonel. And it turned out he was, he was chief of staff. And uh, I'm like, yes, sir. And he's pissed off. And I, I could tell by his uniform, he was a Vietnam vet. And he's pissed off. And, and um, you know, he looks at me and he says, sorry, folk. He said, I just want you to know you can forget about ever getting promoted. And I'm like, why is that, sir? And he said, because you become too well known for the wrong reasons. And I, and I look at him and I said, sir, if these are the wrong reasons, I'm in the wrong job. And I turned around and walked away. And, uh, and I thought, how, how fucked up? What a fucked up thing to say. And, uh, and, I, and then, of course, I'm thinking to myself, how can this 06 back here at Fort Lewis 
have any influence over my career that's managed by a ranger branch at the Department of the Army. I was like, I just like, this, this can't happen. Well, you know, so the, this, of course, you know, this, this, this is uh, end of September time frame. Bam, we're deploying again in October, you know, another rehearsal mission for Panama. I'm trying to put all this shit behind me. I'm just want, want to move on, forget all about it. And um, um, do, do a couple of rehearsal missions back and forth again. Everything seems to be fine. We're down at Eglin. We're doing final rehearsal mission. We think we're going. We're ready to go. And uh, they invade Panama. They sent us home. And we're thinking, what the heck? What the fuck? And uh, within 16 hours of being on the ground, damn, we get the notification. We're deploying. And uh, get your shit back in, back on the bus, back on the plane, back to Georgia. You know, this time it's for real. Live ammo. You know, all the all the war pallets are broken out. We're getting our shit. We're going to Panama. And uh, I was like, oh, finally, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> second battalion jumped in on Rio Hato, which was friggin' pretty intense jump, you know, because we're jumping in under fire. You know, we we were probably in Rio Rio Hato. The first night was pretty intense battle with the PDF, and then uh, we were, we were in Rio Hato for about a week, and then things settled down, and then after that, they decided to deploy us on um, security missions because basically there was the government of Panama was done. No law enforcement, no real government. They, they were trying to reestablish it, but nothing. So we were basically security. We were the ones keeping the peace. What was interesting is the, the Panamanian, Panamanian people, I love them, and they loved us. They were so happy to see us that uh, it, it was really, really a good experience. Unlike, unfortunately, like for other service members that may have gone into other foreign conflicts where the people were not so friendly, Panamanians were great. And so... Good experience. So, you know, we come back, I don't know, I think it was like March time frame. And uh, again, you know, I'm like just trying to get back to business. And then, you know, my first sergeant tells me, hey, Sergeant Folk, you're coming out on the ANOC list. And I was like, thank you. And uh, I'm thinking that ANOC is like, you go to ANOC, Advanced Non-Commissioned Officer Course, you get from what E7. I'm moving on. I'm moving up. I'm moving on finally. So a couple months go by and I'm like, hey, um, so when am I going to ANOC? And he says, I don't know, let me find out. And then he calls me back into the office at the end of the day, all fucking pissed off. And he's like, you're not going to ANOC. You were never on the ANOC list. And blah, 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 blah. I'm like, first time. And he's like, get out of my fucking office. And he was all pissed off. So somebody, somebody got to it. Somebody fucking kiboshed that thing and must have fucking gave him an ass chewing because he had told me that I was on the list. But that's the way it was in the Ranger community. They always let you know. So that happened. I came, I came, I got uh, orders to go to the uh, Ranger Training Company at 25th Infantry in Hawaii. I'm like, fucking awesome. Sold my truck, bought a car, a little convertible, I'm going to Hawaii. I get prepared to go, you know, a few weeks before, they delete those orders. And I'm like, it was just one thing after another, after another, just getting fucked. And uh, cause you know, officially they may not be able to do anything to you, but unofficially they can fuck you sideways. And so now it's like 92, you know, they're, 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 the army is downsizing and, uh, they're offering early outs and I'm like, fuck this, I gotta go. And uh, I could see the writing on the wall. So I had the opportunity, like put in, put in a packet. I was like, I gotta go. Okay, so a couple questions for you. Yeah. Just one question I have as far as the shooting. When you said that that cop tackled you out in the back, what the hell was that about? Why'd he tackle you? Well, because he didn't know who we were. I mean, it's, he, you know, he, he, did, he, did, he didn't know who I was. He just knew that there was a shitload of shooting going on. Okay. And I'm just a body in the alleyway. Is he trying to protect you or is he, was he going to arrest you? What was he? Oh, I think it, it, depending on who I was, he would arrest me. If oh, I was okay. a gang member, he okay. would have arrested me. Okay. Oh, yeah, okay. absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But, but I was not. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, let's, yeah. so let's, let's move on a little bit. So okay, in, but, in 92, you get out of the Rangers. How old are you? Um... Uh, uh, let me see, early thirties. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I know the position that you end up with DEA. Yeah. But, but, here, but there, but, the, but there's a, there's, there's in, in the, in the process of there's something I wanted to tell you something. Yeah. Yeah. In, go ahead. In the go process ahead. of getting out of the army and then how I ended up with DEA. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So I'm getting out. I'm being released and I was pretty pissed. I was discouraged because I loved the army. I love, I mean, I, it was where I was meant to be. And, um, so all, all the fucked up shit, the stories that go along with out processing in the army, everything was happening to me. 
You know, when you go through Central Issue Facility and they issue you all that bullshit equipment, everything they gave me went into a duffel bag. Duffel bag went into a wall locker. Never touched that shit. When I go to turn it in, I pull it out and it, I hadn't, it, it was nothing wrong with it. I go to put, I lay it on the counter, guys, like it's dirty. I'm like, I have never used this. I was like going to blow a fucking head gasket. I'm like, I've never even used this shit. I don't care. It's dirty. And so I had to take it all back, put it back in a duffel bag. I didn't do shit to it. I took it back the next day. And the next, the, I got a different guy. No problem. They took it all back. But um, so I'm, I'm really, really pissed because I'm thinking I'm getting royally fucked here. And, uh, you know, fortunately, I, I had a first song that said, yeah, dude, you're getting fucked. And it was a different first song from the ANOC guy. But anyway, um, the last guy I had to see in getting out was the in-service reserve recruiter. So I walk in to see him. Last thing I got to get signed off. This guy's got my 201 file, which is, you know, paper file, your personnel file. Back then, everything was paper. And he's got my shit and he's looking through it. And he says, you know, Sergeant Folk, he said, he said, you've had all these difficult assignments. You've made all these sacrifices for the army. He said, I know your story. I know you're getting fucked. I know you got railroaded and it, it's a shame, but this is where we're at. And he said, and I know you're pissed. I can tell you're pissed. He said, but just take a moment and listen to what I got to tell you. He said, you got all these years of active duty. He said, don't waste them. He said, you know, my, what I think you should do. He said, I want you to finish out your time in the guard, join the national guard, do your two weeks in the summer, do your one weekend in a month, do the minimum you got to do to get by, but put in the time so that you can get your retirement. And I'm like, okay, okay. That's, that's not a bad idea. So I ended up doing that. I ended up joining the national guard and I did finish out my time. But of course, you know, when you're coming out of the Ranger Battalion and I'm thinking I'm doing the fucking bare minimum, you're still a bit of a rock star in the guard, you know, but I had fun. I had some good units and, and I don't regret it at all. But, um, so now I'm, I'm out. That's, that's like the only thing I've really made a decision on. And then out of the blue, I had a buddy of mine, um, that called me up and he said, Hey, you should, you should apply with DEA. And I'm like, really? I was like, I'd never even thought about it. And so, he, uh, he gave me some advice and then I uh, um, submitted the application through and uh, got called in for an interview. And um, it was kind of funny because, you know, they were asking me a lot of questions about my military background and some things that had happened. And, uh, at the, the, you know, about my deployment and special operations experience and some, some stuff like that, educational background, whatever. And... Um, then it gets kind of the end interview, and I thought things were going pretty good. And uh, we get to, toward, toward, toward the end of the interview, and uh, this one guy, Mike Hurley, great guy, looks at me and he said, so, anything else you want to tell us about? And I'm like, well, yes, there is. And uh, and I said, you know, uh, you're going to hear this story, so I'd like to hear it from me. So I briefly told him the story of the shootout. And I'm thinking to myself, these guys are in Seattle. They're not going to know about anything that happened in Tacoma. But, of course, they got a Tacoma office. They know everything. So I tell him, and he looks at me, he kind of smiles. He said, yeah, I thought you looked familiar. And then I thought, oh, I'm, I'm fucked. You know, I'm thinking that, you know, it's just like going to be like big army and, you know, they're not going to like it. And, and uh, but, you know, fortunately for me, you know, the guy called me up and he said, uh, we're going to bring you on board. You know, I want you in my group. We're going to do this and that and kind of, you know, pave the way for me to, to start at DEA. So, and, so, but Bill, did you, for, when you're applying for the position, are you applying for a special agent position? No. Okay. So why not? Uh, yeah, the time, time, you know, timing, um, I was, I was, I felt like I was too close to the age that it would, you know, it would take too long. Okay. And, and, um, yeah, I don't know. You know, I, I gotta be honest. I, I really felt like I was kind of being guided. You know, I, I believe that everything in life happens for a reason. Sometimes, you know, the things that happen are not good, but they happen for a reason. And, um, you know, one door closes and another door opens. And so when I had this, uh, when, when this, as all this was kind of unfolding, I was, I really kind of felt like I was just going to let it follow the path that it should take, you know, and, uh, you know, being, I, I not be, I just, I felt like I was being guided into some place that I needed to be. You know, I was extremely grateful, um, that I even had the opportunity you know, because I think my life could have turned out totally different. Uh, you know, I think that I, there was a purpose for me to be there. And so, um, you know, when I got the, uh, when I got the nod that they were going to let me start, you know, I, I knew immediately 
you know, that this, this is where I was meant to be. And that I was not, I was, I was grateful for that job, thankful I had that job every day. And I felt like I'm going to make this worthwhile and, uh, you know, do the absolute best job that I can. I'm never going to take this job for granted. And uh, I was thankful to be there because after being fucked by the army so bad, which I loved, and now to have this opportunity, um, it was just, it, you know, to me, it was, it was meant to be. Thank you.